So we're going to talk about auxins today. Auxins a good place to start because it's really the first plant hormone that was discovered, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the evidence for this in just a second. But it's also probably the most complicated one. And as I said, don't get lost in the details of all the various things that auxins do, because you can look them up. I don't expect you to remember them all. Apical dominance, that's probably one that you should have a good idea of, because it's one that we understand reasonably well. Okay, so the initial experiments that show, that suggested a, a mobile information carrying compound actually came from Charles Darwin and his son Francis, who did experiments with blue light and oat coleoptiles and saw that the, the light, the coleoptiles bend toward the light. And they did some, at the time, fairly clever experiments that demonstrated that it's the tip of the coleoptile that's responding to the light. So if you cover the tip with a little piece of something that's opaque, it no longer responds to the direction of light, even if you shine the light down on the lower part of the coleoptile. But clearly, the part that is responding to the light is down below. There's differential elongation so that cells on this side are growing faster than cells on this side, and that's what causes the bending. So what the Darwin suggested was there must be some mobile signal that is moving from the tip to the growing region that is carrying information about the, the light gradient, which side is sunny and which side is shady, to bring about differential growth and the bending that happens there. So lots of interesting little experiments that were done um, removing the coleoptile tip and then putting it on one side or the other and seeing that whatever side you put the coleoptile tip on that's the side that bends the most, that grows the most. Okay, so this, again, suggests there's some mobile signal, but this also suggests there's some asymmetry in that mobile signal, that there's more of it going down this side that's bending than on this side, because if you put the tip on this side and it's a mobile signal, you'd expect it, if it's moving down, you'd have more on this side. The real key that, that um, brought this to a reasonable conclusion was the experiments of Chris, Fritz Went, who basically cut the coleoptile tips off, put them on tops of blocks of gelatin, and then put the blocks of gelatin in, uh, on the tops of decapitated coleoptiles and measured how much they bent. And he could put one auger block or five auger blocks or whatever on there, and as he increased the number of auger blocks, the amount of bending increased. Um, so he was pretty sure that he had, he, there was something that was moving from the coleoptile tip into that auger block that could diffuse then into the decapitated coleoptile and cause the, cause the bending. And this led to, oh, in the early 1930s, the purification and identification of auxin, uh, the compound that accounts for this. And um, the, the terminology in the textbook is messy as far as um, the names of these compounds are concerned. So we have auxin, we have IAA, and we have endol acetic acid. These are all the same thing. Auxin is basically one compound. Actually, it's three naturally occurring compounds, but 99.999% of auxin that's found in plants is indol 3 acetic acid. These chlorinated and indol 3 butyric acids are present in other plants, but they're not present instead of normal auxin. They're present in addition to normal auxin. So all three of these have identical characteristics in terms of binding to receptors. These guys don't have different receptors. Okay? They use the same receptors. They're just, for whatever reason, they, are, they are, have a different structure in a few plants. But as I said, it's the IAA, the indole acetic acid, that is the main auxin in every plant. Um, the textbook also describes a couple of synthetic auxins. Um, these, because auxin has so many developmental effects, it's not surprising that auxin might be used um, as a compound to alter plant growth. So both of these are compounds that are widely used as weed killers. So if you look at the fertilizer with weed killer, if you look at the 
composition of it. It's either got 2,4-D or this dicamba in it. Both of those cause dicot plants to basically grow so fast they kill themselves. That's literally what it does. If you, if you look at um, weeds that have had put these things put on them, for the first three or four days, the leaves elongate dramatically, and then pretty much they die. Okay, so these are, these are compounds that are synthetic auxins that, have the, that bring about the same responses as auxins, but when they're applied in relatively large amounts to plants, cause, um, well, like I said, mostly what they're causing is death of the plant. Okay, so one of the things we want to do to sort of step back for a second from auxin and think more generally about all of the hormones that we're going to be talking about at any given spot in the plant, what is going to determine if the plant is going to have a response to a hormone? At any given place in a plant, so, you know, in the in a, um, epidermal cell or in the vascular tissue or whatever, what's going to determine? Okay, so there's got to be a signal transduction pathway. That's one part of it, right? Remember we use the term competency to respond? That has to be there at the time the signal arrives, otherwise it can't respond. What else? What else is going to determine the, the response? Yeah, there's got to be a signal there. So the amount of the hormone. So both of these things are going to be important. Now, the signal transduction pathways at the beginning of the lecture, I basically gave you the answer to that question, right? So it is developmental, depend, developmentally dependent expression of signal transduction pathways that tells whether a cell has the signal transduction pathway or not. But what we want to focus on now is in general, not just for auxin, but for all the hormones, what is it that determines, what are the processes that determine at any given part of the plant how much of that hormone is there. Because there's a number of different things going on. So we're going to be keeping track of the concentration of the hormone. So what are the things, what are some of the things that are going to determine the concentration of the hormone at any given spot? How broken is the hmm. So you're implying Okay. Okay, so then we're talking about auxin that is not made at that spot but is being transported to that spot? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we could have transport in. In the same way, we could have transport out. So when we talk about polar transport of auxins, Right? You have transport into cells and you have transport out of cells. Those are both going to contribute. What else? When you have those cells, they receive the well, we're just keeping track of, let's just say, in one cell. Right? How much auxin is in one cell? Because we're going to ask, is, let's assume that this cell has a signal transduction pathway to respond. So we're going to ask how much hormone is there? What's determining how much hormone is there? Anna? How much hormone is yeah, so there's going to be synthesis. But now we're talking about synthesis that is local, right, in this cell. Because synthesis, a long ways away, falls into this transport pool, right? Yeah, so we're also going to have degradation then. Anything else? Yeah, so there's basically ways of inactivating and reactivating the hormone without synthesizing and breaking it down. That's called conjugation and deconjugation. And these conjugates, very often it's sticking on uh, a single amino acid or a single monosaccharide. These conjugates are inactive. Sometimes the conjugates are transported. So we'll see in the, in the case of ethylene that ethylene conjugates are the things that are transported in the plants. Sometimes conjugates are stored. So for example, in seeds, 
there are hormones that are stored as conjugates so when the seed germinates the hormones can be released and their, their role in affecting a lot of different developmental processes can be initiated. Okay? So basically this represents an inactive pool that can be quickly reactivated without having to go through synthesis. Okay, anything else? Are we missing anything? Those are the main ones, yeah. Sure, the amount of receptors are going to play a role in the response, but what we're really getting at is what controls the amount of hormone that's there, right? So if there was feedback from those receptors, those might affect local synthesis or local degradation of the hormone, but, right? Okay, so, Anna. What determines how much is transported out versus how much is used in the cell? Okay. Um, the, the formation of conjugates usually happens in the cells where the hormones are synthesized. Okay, so it's, it's not so much transport to one place than forming conjugates and storing, although that's not, not always the case. Um, what will determine how much hormone gets used in the cell? And when we say used, you're talking about triggering a signal transduction pathway versus how much hormone gets transported out? Anybody? What will determine that? Um, how much of the hormone is actually conveyed? Yeah. So, so, so for some hormones, although it's relatively unusual in plants, um, binding of the hormone to the receptor triggers degradation of the hormone. That's common in animals, but it's less, less frequent in plants. What, what does the hormone have to do to trigger a signal transduction pathway? Bind to a receptor. So if the hormone's bound to the receptor, is it in the pool of stuff that's going to be transported out? Right? So the number of receptors will have an indirect effect on how much gets transported out, that stuff that gets bound up to the receptors. Yeah, yeah. we'll see some examples of, of where conjugates are formed, not so much in today's lecture, but in next week we'll, we'll see a number of examples of it. Okay, so we want you to keep in mind that there's a lot of different processes that are controlling the local concentration of hormones. It's not just the transport. One of the reasons this is important for auxins is virtually all cells in the plant are capable of synthesizing low amounts of auxin. Most of the auxin is produced either in the shoot tips or young leaves, a little less in the roots, root tips, mostly in the shoot tips and the leaves. Okay, so auxin is, is, um, can be synthesized by virtually all cells at low levels. But the sort of relevant levels of auxin for signaling pathways are largely the result of transport. Okay? All right. Uh, so I don't want to say much about the pathways of auxin biosynthesis. It's kind of um, surprising for how important auxin is and all the different things that go on in plants. Um, you might think that there would be a swan pathway for auxin biosynthesis, but they're not. There are at least four that have been identified in plants now and one different one that's been identified in bacteria. And we'll talk about the bacterial, why, why bacteria would make auxin, we'll talk about it in next week at this time. But the differences between these, dif these pathways are not what's not important. They basically all start with the amino acid tryptophan and modify that tryptophan to get down here to IAA. But why, what, why, why would it be surprising? Why do I say I think it's surprising that there are three different pathways for auxin biosynthesis? Or why would it make sense to you? Um, are all these pathways found in all plants? Yeah, so that's a good question, right? So are these all found in all plants? And the answer is no. Some of these pathways are only found in certain families, and other pathways are found in other families. Okay, so there's some phylogenetic distribution. So if you look at 
all the different families of plants that auction biosynthesis has been studying in. Some families only have a single pathway. Two different families may have two different pathways. And some families have two or three pathways in them. So on one hand, because auxin is so important, redundancy in the ability to produce auxin makes sense to some extent, right? Having multiple pathways. So if you accidentally get a mutation in one of them, the other one's still functioning there. But the fact that most families only have a single pathway sort of argues against that. So for a single species, are there species that have several of them? Yes. There are some species that have several pathways. Most have a single one, but species A and species B may have two different pathways. Pathway 1 in species A and pathway 2 in species B. Right? So it's, it's pretty weird. It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And to be honest, physiologists and evolutionary biologists are trying to sort of f figure out why this might happen. But it's a fact that there are different pathways. Again, they all start with, well, all the plant-related pathways start with tryptophan. It turns out that the bacterial pathway starts with a precursor in the pathway of tryptophan biosynthesis. Okay, so um, I want to say something quickly about mechanisms of figuring out where auxin is synthesized in plants. This is, this is um, a relatively clever trick that the molecular biologists have come up with. So this is the edge of a developing leaf. And here you can see the vascular tissue that's, that's developing in this part of the leaf. And the way this area where auxin is being synthesized is, uh, has been identified is by taking a reporter gene, a GUS reporter gene. So GUS is an um, a enzyme that breaks specific types of glycoside bonds. And so there's certain types of synthetic substrates for this GUS enzyme that are colorless when they're, before they're cleaved and turn blue after they're cleaved. So wherever this GUS enzyme is expressed, when you put this artificial substrate on your sample, wherever it's expressed is turned blue because of the, the presence of the enzyme. So basically, this is just to remind you, if you're not familiar with this technique of using reporter genes, so you take the GUS gene and you stick the GUS gene in the place where normally auxin-dependent genes are, are present. So you take the promoter that's auxin-dependent and you stick your GUS gene right after that and then you transform the plant. So what that means is wherever auxin is present, the GUS gene will be transcribed and translated. GUS will be present in the tissue. So when then you add that artificial substrate, it turns blue. So it's a nice, simple mechanism of determining where auxin is being synthesized, or in this case, you can actually see not just where it's synthesized, but the path by which it's being translocated towards this differentiating vascular tissue. So it tells you that in leaves, auxin is playing a role in guiding the differentiation of vascular tissues as, as, as they develop in the leaf. Okay, the study question for today asks you to think about this from a different perspective. Rather than putting, um, that, rather than looking for where auxin is produced, um, it's asking you to think about how you could do this with auxin transport proteins by knowing where auxin transport proteins are, are being synthesized. And we'll talk about those auxin transport proteins in just a minute. Okay, so when you look at a pattern of auxin, auxin synthesis in the presence of oxygen. Oxygen certainly looks like it's diffusing or it's doing something moving towards this vascular strand. Would you, could you account for this oxygen movement as just by diffusion? Would it make sense that diffusion is what's guiding that? Come on now, you guys remember what diffusion is. Is that diffusion? Why not? That's right. If it was diffusion, it would be just as much blue over here and down here as there was along here. So that suggests even in the absence of vascular tissue, auction is being guided along a specific pathway, right? 
through a certain range of cells and not through other cells. So this is, this is newer evidence of something that plant physiologists knew 40 or 50 years ago, that auxin transport can occur, and in fact most frequently occurs, independent of the normal conducting tissues, independent of the xylem or the phloem, and happens in a very ordered way. And this has been referred to as polar transport. No, there are some cases where auxin can move in the phloem, particularly uh, auxin that is produced in leaves enters into the phloem, but most auxin transport occurs outside of the conducting tissues. And we'll talk about the mechanism in just a second. Okay, so this suggests that there are, there's some mechanism by which the auxin is being guided from one cell to the next cell along a very specific pathway rather than just diffusing generally from the site of synthesis. Okay, so uh, let's skip that. The first real evidence of polar auxin transport was a relatively clever experiment to take a section of hypocotyl. Hypocotyl is normally tissue that is elongating, right? The, the cells are getting bigger quickly. You excise out that thing, out that section of hypocotyl, and then you put it between two blocks of auger. And the top block you put radioactive auxin in, and then what you want to measure is how much radioactive auxin gets into the bottom block. If you put the apical end, the top end of, the, of this hypocotyl section, towards the top block, you see auxin transport down into the bottom block. If you turn this thing upside down and put the apical end at the bottom, you don't see any transport into the block. So in other words, there is a polarity a directionality built into this excised section so that it knows which way auction should move. It should move from top to bottom, right? If you put the piece of section in upside down and put the radioactive auction in the top, it doesn't move down. If you reverse the experiment and put the radioactive auction down here, it would move up, okay? So it's not gravity either. Right? So there's something built into the tissues that is directing the way this auxin moves, this preferential direction in one, in one, movement in one direction. So let's think about auxin and what might be related to this. Remember that auxin is a weak acid. Here it is down here. It's got an, it's indole acetic acid, so it's a weak acid. So let's consider the fact that auxin can ionize so we'll take the protonated form with the proton on it and recognize that it can ionize to form an anion and a proton. Okay, so looking at the structure of auxin, would you expect that the uncharged form would be membrane permeable? Yeah, it's got lots of, you know, it's a lot of hydrocarbon in there. So this form is membrane permeable. And this form is impermeable because it's charged. So let's think about how auxin is going to partition itself across a membrane. So let's remember that, first of all, the protonated form can easily cross the membrane. So if this is the only thing that's going on in both of these, once it gets out here, you can get ionization. Okay, what's going to happen if we put a pH gradient across this membrane? So let's assume this is a normal cell. It's 
So this is the cytoplasm and this is outside. What's the pH going to be outside? Ballpark. Five. Yeah, it's going to be more acidic. And what's it going to be in the cell? About seven. So we've got a proton gradient across the membrane. So in the high pH side, which one of these reactions is going to be favored? Forming the protonated form or forming the ionized form? Yeah, it's going, to, it's going to preferentially go in this direction, right? So this will be more common. How about on this side? It's going to be going in the opposite direction, forming the ionized form. So what that means is any of the protonated form that moves across the membrane will be preferentially deprotonated. That lowers the concentration of the protonated form and provides a driving force for more to move in. So what that means is for any membrane that has a concentration gradient across it, there is a natural tendency for auxin to accumulate in the higher pH, more basic region. So the total auxin content will be much higher in the pH 7 region than in the pH 5 region because in the pH 7 region, this is preferentially becoming deprotonated, allowing more auxin to move in. So what that tells us is that, is that in general, there is a sort of uniform mechanism by which auxin can move into a cell. You don't need to have any transporter to move auxin into the cell. But if you want to move auxin out of the cell, which form is likely to be the one that's transported? The protonated or the unprotonated form? Why do you say that? Yeah, so then do you need a transporter for it if it's membrane permeable? No, so this is the one that's going to be transported if there is a, right? It's going to be transported out because it's the one that's membrane impermeable. Okay, so basically now you have got all the keys that you need to understanding polar auxin transport. So this is the mechanism, the figure that's given in your book. So let's recognize, first of all, that the protonated form that's present in the apoplast can move without a transport protein into the cytoplasm. And once it gets in the cytoplasm, it ionizes. And basically, that ionized form is trapped. It can't get out because it can't cross the membrane, unless there is a transporter for it. And the thing that gives rise to the directionality of auxin transport is where in the cell the auxin efflux, things that take auxin out of the cell, where those transporters are located. And in stem cells, parts of the plant above the ground, those transporters are preferentially located at the bottom end the basal end of the cell. So what that means is auxin can enter the cell from the apoplast anywhere, but the only place it exits is from the bottom of the cell. And it should be pretty easy to see now, if you have a bunch of these in a row, that that's going to lead to preferential movement of auxin from one cell to the next in the direction towards the roots. So remember, the key to this is the localization of these auxin efflux carriers in the cell. If you want to move auxin in a specific direction, it's where these transporters are located that, de determ that determines the direction of polar transport. Okay? Now, there are auxin efflux or influx carriers. There are proteins that can bring auxin in, but those don't determine the direction. Those are more sort of generally located around the cell. And they're not even critical in most circumstances because we said auxin can cross the membrane in its non-protonated, in its protonated form without any, without any carrier proteins. Okay, so the key to this is understanding the distribution, what determines the distribution in the membrane of these auxin efflux carriers. Okay, there are... Um, Two different types, two different families of 
aux and efflux carriers that are present in plants. The first one that I identified are the pin carriers. And the other ones are ABC carriers. They're ABCD carriers. So these are both aux and efflux carriers. And these are large families. I believe in Arabidopsis there's 17 different pins. And there are hundreds of ABC carriers, but those that carry auxin, I think there are at least four that have been identified in Arabidopsis. And we'll see that the distribution of these in the plant, the developmental distribution of these is quite different. So it means that these carriers are expressed in different cells under different conditions, right? They're not all uniformly distributed. So in the same way that the signal transduction pathways have to be developmentally programmed, the presence uh, of these auxin carriers is also programmed that way. Okay. So if you look at, these are um, shoots that are looking at, um, the place where these auxin carriers occur in shoots, the main place where the transport happens is in the parenchyma cells or the sclerenchyma cells inside the vascular bundles. Okay, so in a vascular bundle you've got xylem and phloem, but you've also got a bunch of parenchyma cells. So the main places that auxin is transported in shoots is in the parenchyma cells of the vascular bundle. So it's in the steel. It's in the vascular cylinder but it's not in the xylem or the phloem. It's through these parenchyma cells. And what this is showing is using um, fluorescent antibodies to, localize, to see where these pin transporters are located. And you really can't see it in this figure, and it's a little hard to see in the, in the textbook, but they really are located at the bottom of each cell, not at the top of the adjacent cell. Okay, so it's showing that, in fact, these auxin efflux transporters are localized at the basal end of cells in the shoots. And it turns out that if you look at the roots, the, in the roots, the transport is typically away from the root tip towards the, towards the shoots, but not in the vascular cylinder, but rather in the epidermal cells or in the, um, the root cap cells that line the, the tip of the, of the root tip. Okay, so the terminology between basipital and acropital, um, pay attention to that. I will try not to use that terminology in any questions that I ask you simply because it's somewhat confusing. I'll say in the shoots towards the roots or in the roots towards the shoots, that sort of thing. Okay, so there's certainly good chemical evidence that, the, that these transporters are localized in specific regions of the... Of the um, cells. Let's stop for a second now. Go back to this experiment. So when we look at one, one more thing we should, we, piece of information that you need. Auxin is the signal that causes cellular elongation. Okay, so in the case of bending, the reason these cells grow more than these cells, the cells on the shady side grow more than the cells on the sunny side, is because of auxin, higher auxin concentration. Okay? So let's see if we can explain how, what's going on with auxin in the tip of the coleoptile to account for this. So we know that within the coleoptile, there's the capability to transport auxin down because we know it's the signal's being received here and it's having its effect down here. So there's some mechanism, polar transport that we just talked about, that's moving the auxin down. But the question is, what's happening in the tip of the coleoptile? Okay, so you've got two different possibilities there. 
One is that one side is producing more oxygen than the other. And the other is what? Yeah, so there's some differential in transport. So it could be it's not transported down as well, or it could be, in fact, that it's transported sideways in the tip, and it goes down this side more than this side. So we have to, we have to distinguish eventually between differences in synthesis versus differences in transport, just like the, the diagram that I showed you earlier. Either one of those could account for the things that we're seeing here. We'll come back to that in a minute. Yes. So, last lecture was about like blue light. Yep. Um, yep. And that was also kind of the dynamic. Yep. How, how do those relate? How does it? How do those relate to each other? How do those relate to each other? What's the blue light doing? Is it um, starting the signal to come? Yeah. So the blue light is a receptor, right? And it's determining the directionality of the light. And what, in the context of the, the question that, that Grace just answered, what is the blue light doing? What's the end of that signal transduction pathway in the, in the coleoptile tip? Yeah, it could be synthesis or something related to the transport, right? If you only have light on the tip and not on the rest of it, yeah. If you illuminate the tip but not the rest of it, it bends. If you illuminate the rest of it but not the tip, it doesn't bend. So the receptor, the light receptors are in the tip, but the responding parts are further down. And that's the role that auxin is playing. Auxin is moving down, carrying the signal. But what we have to figure out is what's happening in that signal transduction pathway in the tip. The blue light receives the signal. And presumably, it receives more on the sunny side than on the shaded side of the tip. But what we have to figure out is what is the end of that signal transduction pathway? Is it causing more oxygen to be synthesized on the shaded side? Or is it doing something with oxygen transport between the sunny side and the shaded side? And we'll come back to talk about that in, in just a minute. This is a complicated diagram. And the only reason I want to show it to you is that it is showing in, for example, in the root tips, the cellular distribution of different pin proteins, of different auxin transport proteins. Okay? So you can see that they're not uniformly distributed. There are various types of, of auxin efflux proteins that are found specifically in different tissues. And the presence of these auxin efflux uh, carriers have helped to sort out how auxin is moving through the root tip. And as I said, the study question for today is relating the, the sorts of GUS experiments that we talked about earlier with where auxin is synthesized. Can you do the same sort of thing with where these pin proteins are synthesized to figure out directions of auxin transport? Okay, so the take home message from this is it's complicated. That there are a number of different types of proteins that are expressed in a very cell specific way that are determining the overall way that auxin moves around the, in the um, root tip or in the apical meristem, shoot apical meristem, or in the, in the axis of the plant itself. Okay, so th there's no larger take home message in this than there's lots of proteins that are involved, it's complicated, and we're only starting to understand why all these different proteins are there. You know, why don't you just have a single, every one of these proteins is doing the same thing. It's determining which, you know, which way auxin moves. They're all doing the same thing. So why do you need all these different proteins? It's a very interesting question that we don't know the answer to. Okay. Um, one of the things that gave important clues about how these auxin efflux carriers work is an experiment where, so here's a normal shoot with the auxin efflux carriers located at the bottom of the cells. If you treat the cells with BFA, which is an inhibitor of exocytosis, so it inhibits vesicles from the Golgi from fusing with the plasma membrane. 
when you do that, you end up with most of the, the auction efflux carriers not in the plasma membrane, but in like the, in the endoplasmic reticulum or the Golgi, in components of the endomembrane system. So this suggests something really important, that the proteins aren't just sitting in the plasma membrane all the time. They're moving back and forth between the plasma membrane and the endomembrane system by vesicles. And when you put an inhibitor in, this particular inhibitor blocks exocytosis. So stuff can go from the plasma membrane back to the endomembrane system, but it can't go the other way. So it accumulates in the endomembrane system. So this is the model for that, that these pin proteins exist in either in the plasma membrane or in some endosomal compartment. So that could be um, in the ER or in the Golgi. And the, there's vesicles that move back and forth between these guys. And the, the BFA is an inhibitor that blocks this step right here. So if the rest of the cycle is going on normally, what you'd expect then was the pin proteins would move from the plasma membrane to the endosomal compartment, but they wouldn't be able to get back to the plasma membrane. So they accumulate here. There are other auction transport, uh, auction transport inhibitors that block the, the endocytosis, the movement of the, the, the proteins from the, from the plasma membrane back into the, to the endosomal compartments. Why? Why does, this, why does it make sense? Why would this even happen? Well, first of all, if you're not a cell biologist, it's important to know that this vesicular traffic to and from the plasma membrane goes on all the time, even in a mature cell. Right? It's not something that's specific to these cells. It's normal for all cells. But why would it make sense to be moving the pin proteins around? There's a couple things that might contribute to this. Yeah, so one way that you could envision this is that this is not something that is specific for the pin proteins. It's moving lots of different proteins around. And that's probably true. That's probably true. But is there an advantage that moving the pin proteins around like this could provide for cells? Well, would moving the auxin transport proteins around provide some way to help deal with? So you can control whether auxin leaves or not, and could you control the direction that auxin leaves the cell? Ah, oh, the light went on at least for one person here, right? Okay, so yes, the key part of this is it allows the cell to easily change where these proteins are located in the plasma membrane to change the direction of auxin efflux. So now let's go back to our coleoptile tip. Right? So if the light's coming from this side, if you've got these cells in here that normally have the auxin efflux carrier at the bottom, what happens in response to the light is through this sort of recirculation these auxin efflux carriers get moved to this side, so the auxin moves preferentially from the illuminated side towards the shaded side, and then it moves down, and there's more auxin on this side than on this side, so it bends towards the light. Okay, so what this permits is flexibility in the direction of auxin transport. So when it's necessary to change the direction of oxygen transport, this allows it to happen relatively easily. It's a lot easier to do this than it is to move stuff around long distances in the plasma membrane. Okay? So a lot of these compounds, these TIBA and NPA, they were originally identified as oxygen transport inhibitors. When you treated these tr plants with these compounds, you lost the polar transport of auxin. So you could imagine that maybe they bind 
to the, to the aux and efflux carriers and inhibit them from functioning. They don't. What they do is they block either endocytosis or exocytosis so that these guys can't move around. So you can't reposition them. How did they figure this out? Well, one of the key things that they figured out from was experiments like this. So when they used inhibitors that specifically block the movement through that cycle of endocytosis and exocytosis, when they use inhibitors that block exocytosis, the pin proteins accumulate in endosomal compartments. If you, if you use one that blocks exocytosis, then they accumulate in the plasma membrane. Oh, how do they know the compounds? Yeah. Somebody else figured that out before that. that was, they didn't discover that associated with oxygen transport. They knew that those compounds inhibited exocytosis and tested them on this and saw that, in fact, it blocked the movement of the, of the oxygen efflux carriers. Stephen? How does the cell control where How did I know that someone was going to ask that question? The question is, how does the cell know whether to fuse the vesicle with the pin proteins here versus here? What's the sort of the short general answer to that? What determines where a vesicle fuses? Uh, there are specific proteins on the cell membrane that, that facilitate the fusion of vesicles. So you... I don't know if you, the, um, what are those, synaptotagins or something like that. I can't remember what the name of the proteins are. Anybody? They're, 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 in a, they're called snare proteins, right, that they're involved in directing vesicle fusion. But there's another important component to that. Yeah, so there's cytoskeletal things as well. So there's two things that are involved there. There's cytoskeletal tracts that direct the movement of the vesicle to specific areas of the plasma membrane. And there are proteins on the plasma membrane that facilitate the fusion. So it's a chicken and the egg problem, what determines where the cytoskeletal elements attach and those sorts of things. Yeah, it's, it's complicated. This just doesn't happen randomly. It's very much controlled. And I don't know the answer to what controls where the cytoskeletal elements attach so that the vesicles move to the right place. Yep. The receptors or where gravity is, like what's the direction of gravity because of the heavy, dense plastic. Yep. So, I mean, what, certainly that must be somehow like affecting the cell. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, so in this cell, let's just say this cell was on the, the bright side of the coleoptile. Right? So there's blue light receptors in this cell that are sensing the bright light. So that's the start of the signal transduction pathway in that cell. What would the end of the signal transduction pathway in that cell be? Yeah, turning it so that the, the vesicles are fusing over here rather than down here. Right. So that's a cellular signal transduction pathway that's affecting cytoskeleton probably is the, is the main thing. Right. And then that moves, moves the auxin to one side of the coleoptile tip, and then as it moves down, you have another signal transduction pathway in these cells down here. Remember when we talked about signal transduction pathways and hormones back at the beginning? And I said, consider signal transduction pathways to be a cellular process. And what the hormones do is couple what happens in a signal transduction and pathway in this cell to what happens in a different signal transduction pathway in this cell. This cell responds to the blue light by changing the distribution of the auxin efflux carriers. These cells respond to differences in auxin concentration by differential growth. So you have signal transduction here, signal transduction here, and a hormone that connects them. That's the easiest way to think about this. Francisca. To move the, the pin proteins, minutes. 
Yeah, it doesn't take very long. So did you guys do in the lab, did you do blue light dependent bending of the coleoptiles? How long did it take between when you turned the blue light on and when the coleoptile started to bend? What was the lag time for that? Yeah, so it was, it was certainly less than an hour, right? More, th more than a minute and less than an hour. So that means that this signal transduction pathway is completed and the auction has moved down and the cells have started responding on the time scale of less than an hour. So, so the light triggers the, those vectors to move their directionally. Well, let's be a little bit more specific. The light triggers the blue light receptor, mm -hmm. yeah. which starts a signal transduction pathway. which ends up by changing where these pin proteins are localized in the plasma membrane. That's what's happening in the coleoptile tips. So then in the adjacent cells, how do those receptors, how do those pins? Yeah, so how do, what's happening over on this? It's, it's, not, it's not so much something that's, the, there's, there's bright light here and dim light here. There's bright light on this side of each cell and dim light on this side of each cell because all of these cells have to be doing the same thing in order to transport the auction this way, right? So in the coleoptile tip, all of the cells are seeing bright light on the right side, dimmer light on the left side, move your auction efflux carriers to the left side. It's not just a single cell, it's all of them in the tip, or most of them. <laughs> no, no, take a cell biology class. I, I don't know the answer. I mean, I know that they can. I have general knowledge about what directs them, but in this specific circumstance, I don't know what it is. It's got to be, I mean, that's got to be the end of the signal transduction pathway that starts with the blue light receptors, right? Okay. All right. Enough of this. Um, I'm not going to spend any time on this because we already talked about this as an example when we talked about signal transduction pathways. So auxin-dependent gene expression is one of the nice examples of inactivation of a negative regulator or a repressor, right? So ARFs are auxin response factors. These are transcriptional uh, activators of auxin-dependent genes. In the absence of auxin, there's this repressor. It's called aux-IAA. Don't ask me how they name these things. It's crazy. But aux-IAA is a repressor that binds to ARF and prevents transcription of the auxin-dependent genes. When auxin comes along, it binds with a component of the, the um, E3 ubiquitin ligase, binds the repressor protein, ubiquinates it, it gets broken down, auxin-dependent gene expression is turned on. And I strongly suggest that if you had trouble with question five in the exam. Look it over, look over my answer. If you have questions, come see me about it because this sort of response is the, is the rule in plants. Inactivation of repressors is what normally happens in the end of signal transduction pathways that affect gene expression in plants as opposed to in animals where it's activation of uh, positive effectors of transcription. So make sure you understand that distinction and also make sure you understand that this is only one of several different ways that inactivation of repressors can occur. Okay? Is this aux IAA the same as the auxin? No. No. Aux-IAA is the name of an auxin binding protein that is a negative repressor. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so these are... This is, here's auxin right there. Yeah, here's auxin right there. So the details of this, if you want to, you know, figure it out, it's, it's fairly interesting. But the key thing is that in the presence of auxin, this repressor of gene transcription is degraded. It releases the repression so that the auxin-dependent genes can, can be expressed. Okay. Looking out at all the glazed eyes. I want to spend just a minute to talk to talk about um, auction dependent cell elongation, making cells get bigger. So think back. 
This is important. Think back to the, to the lecture on cell walls. What is it that allows a cell to expand? What happens when a cell expands? Yeah, so are they covalent bonds between the celluloses and the hemicelluloses and all that kind of stuff? Hydrogen. They're hydrogen bonds, right? So they're non-covalent. So you're weakening those interactions. And what was the main signal that we talked about that weakened those interactions? Acidification. Turned on the proton pump, made the walls more acidic, protonated groups that, that were involved in hydrogen bonding to decrease the hydrogen bonding. So remember we talked about the acid growth hypothesis? So the stimulation of the proton pump in the plasma membrane acidified the cell wall. And that acidification did two things. One, it weakened the non-covalent interactions, the hydrogen bonding. And two, it stimulated those proteins, the extensins, that are also involved in modifying interactions in the cell wall. It loosened the wall, right? So the cell could expand under the Turger pressure. So if I tell you that auxin stimulates cell elongation, what do you suppose the signal transduction pathway is in those cells that respond to auxin by elongating. What's the starting point? Auxin receptor, right? What's the end point? Yeah, stimulate the proton pump. That's basically it. Auxin-dependent cell enlargement is dependent upon a signal transduction pathway, senses auxin, turn on the proton pump. It actually also expresses the proton pump more. So this is an effect that happens not just for a couple of minutes, but can last for many hours. So the coupling, the link, between auxin and cell elongation is something that you already understand. The only part that you didn't know was that there was a signal transduction pathway that connected auxin to elongation. Do all cells respond to auxin by elongating? We learned right in the coleoptile example. The cells in the tip don't, expand, don't respond to auxin by expanding. It's only in a short region of the coleoptile that actually respond to it, right? So it means only certain cells will have the signal transduction pathway to respond to auxin by elongating. So if you take a mature petiole of a leaf and you put auxin on it, it won't do anything. But if you take a hypocotyl or a coleoptile and put auxin on it, it will expand. It will lengthen. Okay? Adam, do you have a question? Um, are there cells that do have a signal transduction for the receptor and all the tissue and they don't respond to elongation? They don't respond by elongating? Well, if they have the signal, if they have the, re the receptor and all the signal transduction pathway, they will elongate. So that's the only thing that auxin does. Yeah. Oh, is that the only thing that auxin is doing in those cells? Right. What I'm saying is, like, you could have the receptor, but it, the end product could be cause something else. Yes, but then that would be a different signal transduction pathway, okay. right? Sure. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so it's the signal transduction pathway that is, determines what the cell does in response, whether it's in the coleoptile tip, moving the pin proteins, or down lower in the coleoptile, turning on the proton pumps to activate stem elongation. Several transaction pathways in one cell, and maybe one only responds to a certain whatever. You have to come over a certain threshold. threshold yeah. To yeah. So that's 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 the point we're going to get to now. There is a concentration dependence to these responses. So this is the a figure from your text that describes stem elongation as a function of auxin concentration. Okay. So it's telling you that. At lower auxin concentrations, it promotes elongation. But at higher concentrations, it actually inhibits elongation. What does this curve look like for root cells? What does auxin 
generally, what do we think about auxin doing in roots compared to shoots? Shoots it stimulates growth. What does it do in roots? Don't remember? This is one of those big things you should be remembering from the chapter. It does the opposite in roots. Auxin concentrations, physiological auxin concentrations more often inhibit root growth. Why does that happen? It doesn't show you in the book, but it tells you in the book. This curve shifts by three orders of magnitude to the left to lower auxin concentrations for roots. So the concentrations of auxins are actually the same in the shoots and the roots. But in the shoots, they cause elongation. If we shift this curve over by three orders of magnitude, the same concentration is going to cause inhibition. So it's a different difference in the sensitivity of the auxin receptors in the roots compared to the shoots that are determining this opposite response. Same auxin concentrations, different responses because the receptors are different. Okay, so let's finish up by talking about Let's go back to this experiment with a coleoptile tip. And the question was whether or not there were differences in synthesis on the two sides or it was a redistribution of auxin. And this is a very clever experiment that was done to try and sort this out. So it, the one thing we left out of that possibility was not only could we be synthesizing auxin on on the shaded side, but we could also be destroying auxin on the sunny side, right? That could be a possibility. So if you put the coleoptile tip on top of an auger block in the dark, you get so much auxin out of it. You put light on it from one side, you get the same amount of auxin, okay? So whatever the light is doing, it's not making more auxin or it's not making less auxin. The same amount of auxin is present in the coleoptile tip in the dark and the light, okay? So if we take the, an, um, the same experiment and we put a piece of plastic that separates the auger block and the coleoptile tip and we put light on from one side, we see that there's no change in the amount of auxin there. That is, there's no synthesis on one side or no degradation on the other side. But if we only put that, that piece of plastic partway through the coleoptile tip, we see higher auxin on the shaded side than on the illuminated side. So this was the key experiment that really demonstrated before we had all this evidence about the auxin efflux carriers that that was a lateral redistribution of auxin in the coleoptile tip that's accounting for the asymmetric growth, that's accounting for the, the bending towards the light source. Okay, so this should make sense to you uh, how this fits into the picture of moving those pin proteins around in response to light. Okay. How about gravity perception? We know that if you take uh, roots of most plants and you grow them horizontally, the tips bend down towards the, the center of the earth, parallel to the direction of gravity. How does this happen? The book gives uh, an explanation that is widely accepted, although not uniformly, that there are, in plant roots, there are plastids that store starch. We call them amyloplasts. Um, but when they're involved in gravity perception, they give them a different name for the same organelle. They call them statoliths. Statolith is just an amyloplast in the roots. And statoliths are relatively dense. If you take a plant cell or plant root and turn it upside down, the amyloplasts sink down to the bottom of the cell. And the hypothesis is that there are stretch receptors in the, in the um, endoplasmic reticulum that when these statoliths fall down on them give information about the, the bottom of the cell, which way gravity is. And that that is the initiation of a signal transduction pathway that gives rise to auxin redistribution and bending of the, of the root tip. Uh, the only reason I'm saying something about this in a little bit more detail is because there's a lot of evidence that doesn't support this hypothesis. For example, in Arabidopsis, 
it's very easy to isolate starchless mutants, mutants that don't make, can't make these dense ameloplasts. Those starchless mutants respond perfectly well to gravity. Okay. So this can't be the whole story. And I don't want to go into detail. I wish I could talk about it. But there's a professor here in, in this department who's come up with a completely different mechanism of gravity sensing in plants that I would say overall is more consistent with the evidence that's available. But for some reason, people just don't want to accept. It's sort of, this has been around for 50 years, and, and people are used to talking about it. But so, so, although plant roots certainly do respond to gravity, the mechanism by which that happens, the mechanism by which it's sensed, is not entirely clear at this point. OK. In root tips, the bending is, again, associated with the redistribution in the um, in auxin in the root tips. And it's a redistribution to auxin on the lower side of the root tip. So the auxin efflux carriers must be relocating to the lower sides of the cell so that auxin is preferentially moving in this direction than away from the, the root tips. Remember that in the, in the roots, the auxin moves away from the tip in the epidermal cells or in the cells associated with the, with the root cap. So here's a picture of a horizontal root that's showing where auxin is located. And you can see there's a lot more auxin along this trace of cells uh, in the epidermal cells at the bottom side than there is on the top side. So remember then, in addition to this, that in roots, high auxin inhibits elongation rather than stimulating it. So the higher auxin concentration here keeps these cells from elongating as much. These cells elongate more, and the root bends down. So the difference in the auxin response between shoots and roots has everything to do with the concentration dependence of the auxin receptors, and not in how the proteins move around that transport the auxin. Anna. Well, we know that the, the, the difference is because of the concentration dependence of the auxin receptors. So it's the, the difference is not something that's in the signal transduction pathway or the response. It's how the auxin receptors respond to the concentrations of auxin they're encountering. So it's got to be differences related to the characteristics of the receptor. No, no. As far as I know, they're just they're just two different receptors. So the receptors that are present in the roots. I mean, if you look in the textbook, I think it even labels them. The receptors that are, that are present in the roots are different pin receptors. Not different. Not sorry. Not pin receptors. Um, A R X receptors than they are at the in the shoots. Within the root, same receptor that yeah. Inhibits yes. Same receptor, but it binds auxin at lower concentrations. So it stimulates at lower concentrations, and it inhibits at lower concentrations. So as I said, just take this curve for shoots and shift the whole curve two or three orders of magnitude to the left, and that's what happens in roots. OK, um, let's stop there. And on Thursday, we'll finish up with one quick discussion of apical dominance as the one example of physiological responses I want you to focus on, OK? So the next six, seven lecture topics on hormones, if you had any difficulty with the signal transduction pathway chapter or the growth and development chapter, go back. Anytime that you see something in the, in the hormone chapters that relates back to those that you don't understand, please go back and check those things out or come talk with me because the key to understanding what's going on in these chapters is signal transduction and development, okay?